much. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, before I came for my job talk and campus visit, um, I actually had presented in the African Studies brown bag. So I feel like I'm kind of returning in many ways to the beginning of my, uh, my path and my journey to Carleton. So as we'll be considering coloni uh, the colonial context of Africa, I'd like to start by turning to our more immediate colonial context and acknowledge that we're on unceded Algonquin territory. And I thought I'd start by telling you a little about how this new project came about. Um, I, uh, as you know, come from a pretty interdisciplinary background, so I've taught courses in cultural anthropology and public history, and I now find myself in the enviable position of being able to teach my own upper-level seminar, uh, which is in many ways designed around some of the issues I'll be exploring with you today. Now, one of the things that happens um, when you teach across different fields is that you recognize there are really different challenges uh, depending on the content of what you're teaching. And as many of you in the room may know, when you teach about Africa, it demands a certain amount of unlearning. So I really see my role as a, as a teacher um, as sort of facilitating this unlearning process in which I try to identify and critically interrogate the assumptions and preconceptions that students have internalized. So even for students who think that they don't know anything about Africa, and that's usually how uh, the class starts, um, they actually have internalized a great deal of images, assumptions, and preconceptions about the continent just as a result of being inundated with these images from all corners. So one of the things I do to start classes with African content is I do an anonymous survey and I ask students to just quickly jot down all the things that come to mind when they think of Africa. So this represents uh, a pretty typical distribution of the key words that students think of. Now as you can see, most of these associations are quite negative. Um, and often rooted in long-lasting tropes that can be traced back several hundreds of years to early encounters and to what scholars refer to as the colonial project. This was a largely European project that involved territorial expansion, exploitation, and dispossession of indigenous peoples across the globe. Foundational to this project were the twin notions of difference and inferiority. So I'd like to briefly uh, just touch on a bit of basic colonial history because in many ways it forms the backdrop but also the content of the images that we'll be looking at shortly. So Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish physician, zoologist, and botanist. And he is noted for establishing a linear view of nature that was embodied in his uh, Scala Naturae that he came up with in 1767. This was an ordering scheme with a nested hierarchy of species, uh, genera, families, orders, classes, phyla, and kingdoms. And it's a system that is still used in the sciences today. So at the core of this ordering system was his designation of five different kinds of humans. They included Americanus, so these would have been Native Americans, Europeanus, uh, Asiaticus, Africanus, and then the fifth category of Monstrosus. So while the colon colonial project was deeply embedded in scientific um, approaches and methodologies and claim making, it was also, I argue, a deeply imaginative project. Okay, so as we see in this uh, example of some of the kinds of beings that would have gone into his fifth category um, of, the, of the monstrous mythological humans, which didn't appear um, obviously in person, but haunted uh, the images and the dreams of a lot of Europeans. 
So even more uh, explicitly scientific approaches that worked with methods such as craniometry, the measuring of, skill, of uh, skulls, also involved this imaginative fictional process, as you can see in this diagram from 1857. So here we have a sense of the hierarchy that undergirded the colonial ideology in which we find um, chimpanzees at the bottom, uh, the so-called Negro in the middle, and then representing white Europeans is actually not a real person, but once again, this uh, romantic, fantastic, imagined figure of Apollo. One of the big driving questions of the colonial period as, as part of this um, strong impulse to, to know, to discover, and then also to order and to categorize and to classify the, the variation that early explorers were encountering was the question of this relationship between apes and humans. The answer to that question was found in the figure of the African who was regarded by most as the missing link. Along with the scientific orientations um, uh, and exploration project came um, also a, a sort of ethical charge that is often referred to as the notion of the civilizing mission. Okay, and this is represented in this cartoon uh, from 1899, which draws from the poem by Rudyard Kipling called The White Man's Burden. And in this image we see um, imperial powers uh, carrying as a great burden on their back baskets full of indigenous people representing the colonized. So the civilizing mission was a justification for colonialism, but it was also a means of control. So projects um, instituting Western education, hospitals, programs in health and hygiene, and also the uh, the imposed conversion to Christianity. These all served not only to make Europeans uh, feel good about their benevolence, but again, to control the local populations. So all of these things formed the discursive, ideological, and political landscape that was involved, uh, that of course involved a great deal of imaginization and romanticization. So as James mentioned, most of the images that I'll be looking at, but not all, um, come from South Africa. So I'd like to look a little more specifically at the colonial context of South Africa. So this essentially started in 1652 with the arrival of Jan van Riebeck and the Cape Colony at Table Bay. Um, when he arrived, he was representing the Dutch East India Company. and. Uh, through the years, um, the Dutch and the British asserted their presence in, in a variety of ways, and I'm glossing over a complex history here. Um, but the important thing to know is that uh, while this, this current country of South Africa was colonized by two colonial powers, they were not always aligned. So at times they were really fighting with each other quite directly, as in the South African War, otherwise known as the Anglo-Boer War. Um, and the Union of South Africa, after a lot of conflict, was declared in 1910. Now, two key events that really shaped the history of South Africa centered around the discovery of valuable minerals in the Earth's core, uh, crust. So in 1867, diamonds were discovered at Kimberley, and shortly thereafter, in 1886, gold was discovered in the Witzwatersrand. So within the context of the development of especially the gold mining industry, the consolidation of whiteness from the previously divided British and Afrikaners uh, was really crucial to maintaining order. So this was based, again, on a heavily moralized foundation of white supremacy and minority rule. This is why this consolidation was so important. So a range of segregationist policies were designed to entrench white control. 
Now across the globe, in, in various colonial contexts, photography was a powerful tool of colonization and knowledge production. The dagger type reached Durban via Mauritius in September of 1846. And not, people, not many people had access to the camera initially, but within five years, three daguerreotypists had established photography studio businesses. Now there's a, there's a fair amount of scholarship by people like Paul Landau, uh, Elizabeth Edwards, Susan Sontag, who've looked at uh, represent, representations of racial difference in colonial photography. And photography played this incredibly important role in the anthropological efforts to codify and rank different human types, as we saw earlier, including different races, but also um, the undesirables of society, like degenerates, um, criminals, and the mentally insane. So before I start showing you some of these images that I've been working with, um, it's important to note that all of these images in the colonial postcards have been staged in multiple ways. The issue of power in the staging, capturing, distributing, commenting on, and circulating of images of Africans is something that I would like to reflect on as well. So, before I show you these images, I, I start with the caveat that I don't believe that what I'm showing you is, is really, um, uh, is giving you a sense of colonial Africans. What I'm showing you is a set of social constructs. Okay, and this is really different. And, and you have to sort of uh, guard against the, I think, tendency, particularly when you're viewing black and white documentary looking images, uh, to keep your critical consciousness high. So, so these social or cultural constructs um, have been developed by society and they represent a perception of an individual group or idea that is constructed through cultural and social practice. So in what follows, I'll discuss some of the main tropes of representation I see in this early survey of images of African children in colonial postcards. Um, and I do this using the concept of trope. And this is something that I found very helpful in my teaching as well. So um, as, as a, an assemblage of different meanings, um, trope is is a way of representing themes that perdure and that recur and that speak to larger sets of understandings than any single image can convey. So why postcards? Uh, my other work examines constructions of childhood in apartheid South Africa, and so that's long been something I've been interested in. and. Uh, as a historian, um, looking back to even the, the recent past, there's just not a whole lot of material that I can work with. Children are not being discussed, they're not being represented, and they don't appear in the archive with very much regularity. So there are several studies that examine colonial postcards, um, and there are some that touch on images of children but what I was interested in doing is spe specifically looking at children to understand the ways in which they're represented. And I do this because I think it has something to teach us about the broader experience of colonialism and also about the experiences uh, uh, and constructions of childhood globally. So as a form of media, postcards reflect, produce, and help spread perceptions of Africans as fundamentally different and inferior to the British. Okay, this is something that was true in the colonial period and it's something that is also true today. Also conveyed in these images are justifications for the colonial project as a civilizing mission. Although the postcards I'm focusing on depict black Africans, they are often just as much about white South Africans' preconceptions and preoccupations. And although often presented and regarded as documentary evidence, the images on these postcards are also very much about imagination. 
So Christopher Geary, who's done a lot of work on postcards, understands the postcard as a tangible manifestation of the us and then them dichotomy. And in his extensive surveys of colonial postcards, he finds that the majority of images depict women in the form of nudes or semi-nude um, objects for the male gaze. The golden age of postcards is said to have occurred from 1907 to 1915. And this was a time uh, that was marked by an incredible distribution of postcards that linked uh, colony and metropole and circulated once they, re they were received by the recipients in a whole host of, of ways as well. So postcards were inexpensive, they were convenient, and they helped facilitate long-distance communication. They were largely sent by European travelers and workers who were abroad. And as Landis argues, postcards join image with text in a mobile relationship of implication, proximity, and hierarchy. So I view postcards as, uh, in, as actually enacting ideology. And in many ways, they're a performance of the colonial project, but also of the experience of being there for the person who sends them. So this performance happens on multiple levels. Um, at the first level, uh, it's in the image. It's also in the caption that's often accompanying the postcards, and then on this additional layer of writing uh, that's, that's found in some cases on postcards. Now the main thing that I see as I look across these postcards is an argument about difference. Uh, so I just want you to sort of keep that in mind. Um, and it's, it's not a lateral difference, it's a very hierarchical difference. So that's one of the, the main lenses through which I read these images. And I also um, respond to Stuart Hall's charge to consider cultural products alongside cultural practices. And to that end, I think it's really important to view these images um, in the social and political context in which they circulated. So once received, the postcards would have been read, shared, displayed, and even recirculated. So in terms of my method, I'm employing what Stephen Dubin refers to as a residual me methodology in looking at a very fragmented and very partial archive of decontextualized postcards. Uh, so just as an aside, I, I stumbled across my first uh, small set of, of colonial postcards in a used bookstore while I was doing my research in Cape Town. And I was so excited to actually have an image um, have a, a few images that depicted children. So I picked them up. Uh, my dissertation project was on a much more contemporary period, um, looking at 1976 through the present. But I held on to these postcards, um, and then I've, I've slowly been uh, collecting them as I encounter them when it's affordable. And also, um, <laughs> thanks to the old uh, command copy function, um, I've actually downloaded quite a bit that I found on online, um, online auctions. Okay, but this is a very kind of random approach. Okay, and a lot of the basics that you would expect a historian to be able to report on in terms of the, the survey um, size, are just, it's just blank information for me. I have no idea the total number of postcards that were produced. I often have very little information, um, including even about the date of their production. Uh, when they are actually mailed, that gives you uh, an indication if you can read the postal mark of when they were sent. Um, but, but this is a very kind of broken and fragmented domain that I'm stepping into. So, the first thing that I see is actually invisibility, particularly when it comes to children. So, historian Jennifer Beinart has looked at colonial photographs and with a focus on images of African children in sickness and health, 
Um, she finds a lot of the same things that I do in this early survey of colonial postcards. So she writes that children's widespread participation in adult social and economic life meant that they appeared in the photographic record, but rather by accident than intention. So I just start with this image because I, I'm always trying to think about when I look at things visually, not just what is depicted, but what's absent. And that's a huge part of, uh, of my consideration. Okay, another dominant uh, genre of representation or, or representational, representational trope is this, this uh, way in which children appear as appendages of their mothers. And this is something that Beinart also identifies. So in this image, it's not the best example because we actually can see a little bit of the face of that infant. Um, but often you're just seeing a sort of uh, shrouded figure the, the gender of the child is unknown. There's no way to really read much individuality. Okay, this is also somewhat unusual because the baby is identified in the caption. So the caption says Zulu woman and her baby. Uh, most of the postcards that I examined were produced by a studio um, called Solo Epstein and Company. And I know that they produced at least 2,000 postcards. Um, it was it's been written, uh, but not really uh, documented with any verifiable sources, that they were the main producers of postcard images in South Africa. Uh, a historian named Richard Vokes has done an extensive study of, of colonial postcards in Uganda, and he traces out the history of the arrival of the first cameras, and notes that many of the postcards that circulated and were produced actually came from personal uh, images captured um, by missionaries, by various colonial officials. And after taking photographs, they would then take their negatives to be developed in these very small studios, and the negatives would often be kept on file and then reproduced um, at demand, by demand at later points. So another of the, of the sort of broader themes of representation are these landscape shots. Okay, and I'm wondering, does anyone uh, see any sort of disjuncture with, my, with this image and, and the label that I've given it? Does this seem like a landscape shot to you? Why not? <laughs> It's not proportional. Well, what what do you see when you look at that image? What's people? People, yeah. People, right? Landscape shots we usually think of as being of the land. So this is a very interesting thing. Um, landscape shots, uh, because of the ways that Africans were regarded as being um, uncivilized, as being closer to nature and as part of nature, in fact, being more like animals than like people, African people often sort of sink into and blend into the landscape. And I have this, um, this interesting example that I found. So the caption here is natives attacking the enemy. So obviously it's a very contrived um, staging, right? Uh, it's also sort of doubly contrived because it's been touched up and tinted with color. But if you can, read what was written on the back by Tom. So Tom says, I don't know if you will like this, but if nothing else, it gives you a good idea <laughs> of, the Af of South African scenery and the country we have to go over. Okay, so sitting here in the Canadian context, we should all be deeply, painfully aware of the power of the myth of the empty landscape in settler colonial societies. And this is something that was also true in the context of South Africa um, and across the, the continent as well. Um, so the hallmark of, of settler societies is to view landscapes as empty, and this is very convenient for claiming territory and as Van Eden writes, inscribing it with new meanings by means of travel, naming, and mapping. Okay, so when I'm trying to look at these postcards and, take, and read them as a source in this sort of palimpsest 
uh, way to look at all of the information that's encoded, I feel that this, this writing in juxtaposition uh, to the image actually tells us a lot about colonial ideology. And it's not just reflecting that ideology, but it's also doing something in the world. It's, it's giving us a set of assumptions and a way of looking. It's establishing a regime of looking that gets internalized and gets reproduced and fits into this sort of uh, cultural logic uh, that's not necessarily logical, uh, which then shapes the way that we view Africans as people. Okay, so again, just to, to come back to this colonial impulse to, to classify and codify and order indigenous peoples in ways that were, that, that, that really flowed into the same ordering processes that were taking place in regard to flora and fauna. Okay, so another main trope of representation that I see is um, Africans as specimens. And a lot of images and postcards um, resonate with and even double as ethnographic images. Okay, so there's two main types of ethnographic photographs that were captured in this period. One is the, the sort of formal um, portrait, which is really about uh, looking at the different physical variations. And the other is this sort of in situ scenario. Right, so here once again we see um, natives blending into the landscape. And the tension between the different levels of text I think here too is quite revealing. So the caption is natives at home. So you see uh, this extended um, household and you, you see all the way on, the, on your right what is, is possibly the beginning of, of a dwelling structure, right? So that would probably be the home. But curiously, that's not what's being included in this image at all. So the implicit assumption is natives at home is just natives out in the landscape, in the wild, um, blending into the natural scenery. Now when I said that, that the dominant um, the dominant frame of presenting and reading these images was one of difference. I think that that comes through in the written text on this postcard as well. So there are two main responses, uh, or two main sets of messages that are conveyed in these postcards. The first is incredibly mundane. So I've read hundreds of, uh, of scrawled handwriting passages saying things like, we went to church on Sunday, hope to see you soon, right? Nothing really of, of any import. And incredible repetition, just about the very basics of, you know, I saw Helen yesterday, um, take care. But then the second most common message that I've seen is uh, this sort of move that I'm still trying to characterize in language. But it's basically an attempt to, um, invite the reader to imagine himself or herself in this foreign, exotic, other context. And of course, it's, it's such a, a ridiculous thing to think about that um, I assume that it's meant to be a sort of lighthearted, almost humorous gesture. So in this bottom left corner, it reads, what do you think of the Kaffir ladies? And I apologize for the term, which is an incredibly racially derogative term, um, but this was commonly used at the time to refer to Africans. Um, so what do you think of these ladies? Very fascinating, are they not? Okay, so you often have um, cap, uh, handwritten messages saying, how would you like one of these for your wife? Or um, what do you think of living in this house? That kind of a thing that invites the reader to imagine themselves into these contexts that are quite foreign and exoticized. This is a very common form of representation, which involves basically lining up a bunch of children, sometimes adults as well. And again, I really read this image as an example of a sort of science, pseudo-scientific um, accounting for uh, these people. <coughs> 
not really as people and individuals, but as racial types, examples of, of racial types. Okay, so we don't get a sense of, of individual people. And curiously enough, because another part of the anthropological set of interests was in kinship, you're not actually able to read much about the kin relations of this group of people. It's just sort of a, a generic, homogenous mass. One of the other common tropes is children as fauna. Okay, and this is particularly true of children. It happens with Africans a little bit in general, but it's, it's especially common uh, with children. So here we see this, um, this manipulated image of these two Zulu children that have been placed into, I don't know is, if that's supposed to be a dinosaur, a set of dinosaur eggs or something. Okay, and the, the caption is bashful and cheeky. So it, again, it's this, um, it's this closeness and this sort of um, inseparable connection between Africans and their natural environment. Okay, and you see that um, in many images that place African children in particular in really close proximity to a range of animals. Okay, sometimes they're pigs, sometimes they're um, killed uh, antelopes, and things like that. Also, there's a range of images which refer to children as animals. And again, this is very much in keeping with uh, a lot of the ideas of the time. So this is a book written by a missionary named Dudley Kidd, who became somewhat of a self-styled anthropologist. And uh, he took it upon himself to explore Kaffir children, um, wh whom he regarded as the pinnacle of development for Africans in South Africa. And I'd just like to read this quote because it really touches on a lot of what I'm reading in these images. When he, uh, the adult uh, African, calls his children in fun little animals or little baboons, it is safe to say that he indicates the obvious, if superficial, character of his children. No one can look at a number of little naked Kaffir children sprawling on the ground, playing games, setting bird traps, tumbling over one another like so many little puppies, without laughing and saying beneath his breath, what delightful little animals. Okay, so the references to animals are so multiple in that one paragraph, right? But the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this sort of playful, um, romantic, seemingly perhaps benevolent, but deeply paternalistic um, tenor of this comment. And this book is absolutely full of passages like that. And it's a sort of uh, everyday, in layperson's terms, description of these core ideas about African inferiority um, that were uh, that were central to every aspect of the, of the colonial project. Okay, so one of the other things that uh, I'll say to, to try to impress upon you the importance, the crucial importance of looking at children in studying colonial Africa is that an examination of children in, is in many ways an examination of adults because of the unfortunate fact that African adults were essentially regarded as children. Okay, so what we see in this image is a reference to the Kaffir boy. So any adult man could only be a boy. And this is true in in the apartheid period as well. Any adult woman could only be a girl if she was African. And part of this process of, of infantilizing African adults involved also genericizing them. So they were not imbued with any sort of individual human qualities. So in this image, we see a man of European descent who is named as an individual, Fred Poulon. 
And then there's just the Kaffir boy, right? And that could really just be any black male that uh, fits into that image. Okay, another um, huge set of pictures that's represented in, in colonial postcards uh, concerns the rickshaw drivers in Durban. Okay, so these men were also referred to as boys. And this, the, the dress um, that's involved in pulling these, these carts, these rickshaws, uh, is obviously trying to draw on the tropes of exoticism. And you still have people dressed up quite similarly, actually, um, although now they usually have shoes. Uh, in Durban, you can ride in one of these. So again, this is an example of this sort of invitation to uh, consideration, which I argue is actually a, a distancing move. So the writer um, asks the recipient, how would you like to ride behind these deer? Okay, and, and this would have been uh, an object of, of incredible interest back in England, as most of my postcards were sent and then um, this one I included because it also shows the ways in which everyday violence, right, which was also structural violence, was presented in these sort of playful, portable postcards. So if you read the, the message on this one on the right, it says, Rickshaws take the place of cabs here. And the more one kicks the boy, the faster he runs. So I want you to just take a moment to think about the, the violence that's embedded in that. Not just the symb symbolic violence of the reference to an adult man um, in this very dehumanizing way, um, but also the literal invocation to violence, which is something that is funny and entertaining for the recipient. Okay, so this is an image just showing you what it looks like if you're actually to climb in one of these. Another common trope of representation concerns um, African children as beneficiaries of the civilizing mission. So you see a lot of images such as this, and these are usually produced by missionaries uh, and then sent back. Um, they also appear in, in some exhibits that took place back in the metropole. And here you see examples of Africans who are being converted, who are being uplifted, right? So with their um, adoption of Christianity, with their education in, uh, in Western, um, in, in a Western context, and also with their adoption of, um, of prayer, they're approaching what it is to be European, but that's something that can never actually be realized in full. So as, as Jennifer Beinart found in her examination of colonial photographs, the photographs show children as, as a kind of go-between. And their images grew in importance from that earlier period of really being largely invisible. Uh, they grew in importance in the colonial lens as the need to establish a dialogue increased in the face of the growing movement for self-determination in the colonies. There's another range of images which uh, I refer to as the trip of African children as objects of amusement. And again, this often involves a display of some level of discomfort, which is really um, meant to be kind of the punchline to a joke. Uh, so in this image, the caption, if you can read, it says, Troubles in the Interior. Now this is referring to a very real set of uh, 
of political circumstances that cause incredible concern and expense for uh, the colonial uh, officials. But when coupled with this image of the crying, unhappy child, um, it's, it's an object of amusement. So here we see the violence and dispossession of the colonial project expanding further into the interior, which is essentially turned into a punchline. Okay, and returning to this recurring theme of difference. Difference through uh, encounter and through um, a sort of juxtapositioning. This image shows um, older Africans, but it really is emblematic of the kinds of pairings that I'm, that I'm seeing as I survey these images. So the caption reads, the latest in motors. And of course, you see this uh, version of, I guess, an African car. Right? So the, the ideas that are conveyed in this image center around the backwardsness, the incompetence, um, and the ridiculousness of the African native. <coughs> Um, Jennifer Barnard also talks about the ways in which African bodies were grossly misread and misunderstood. So in a lot of colonial images focusing on the issues around um, Africans' health, um, you see pictures such as this. So this child with, with his distended stomach um, is obviously suffering from a disease of malnutrition, probably quashe core. So children with distended pot bellies uh, which is a condition caused by malnutrition, um, were often seen as objects of humor. Now, I've seen a few images, but I, I couldn't actually uh, find one to capture, that present a figure like this with a caption along the lines of, um, you know, ate too much at dinner, right? So that juxtaposition again, and, and the violence embedded in that kind of a, a gross misunderstanding um, speaks to speaks to the power, I think, of these images to try to go, uh, to provide an opportunity to read against the grain in looking at these, these extremely contrived and staged colonial images. I wasn't quite sure which genre to put this one into. And as you are probably getting a sense, a lot of these representational tropes kind of overlap and, and bleed into one another. So in this image, which also appears in um, some ethnographic collections. Uh, someone off camera, behind the camera, presumably a white European, has thrown some, some money onto the ground and the children are all rushing to collect it. Okay, so again, what I see in this image is, is this sort of bleeding into the landscape, um, but also a sort of animalistic depiction that's finding humor in uh, this scramble for money, which is coming out of a context of, of poverty and suffering. Um, in this image, we see again the kind of juxtapositioning of the, the native African. Um, the backdrop is quite telling, right, because it's really uh, an empty landscape, quite literally. And here we have some of the trappings of modern day European civilization. So we have the newspaper, the eyeglasses, uh, the clean white uh, tablecloth. And again, this image would have been viewed as a way to both justify the civilizing mission, to reinforce the sense of European superiority, and also to sort of have a little laugh at the ridiculousness of the African colony. This is an interesting recurring theme, and I haven't uh, fully developed my interpretation of, of what this is all about. But there are several images that present African children in particular um, as food. In this image, the caption is titled Cake Fruit. 
and we see uh, a young African child sitting in a basket that would otherwise be used to hold um, fruit that would be harvested. Uh, at, at the most basic level, what I see here is uh, a kind of dehumanization and objectification uh, that's really in keeping with the, with the other themes. Okay, in this one, Uncomfortable Quarters, we see two very unhappy children who've, who I think have been placed into this pot. Um, it's possible that that's also a manipulation, but uh, to me it looks like it might not be. Um, so here the ideas invoked are, once again, making this connection between the consumable African child. Uh, to me it also points to the, the imagined cannibalism of native people, and this is something that featured prominently in a lot of adventure novels that were circulating at the time. Okay, and if children aren't seen as food, there's a deep interest in seeing them eat. Okay, so there's lots of images, such as this one, of both children and adults that are focused around some sort of a meal. Uh, and in this image, I think that the staging is also quite important. So we see this empty field, it's really just dirt. And if we think about what's going on symbolically in terms of uh, the framing of the image, the colors, uh, the focus, we're seeing an argument, a visual arm argument that African children are poor, they're unhealthy, they're improperly cared for, uh, they're often diseased, but they're also natural, noble, and cute. So. You know, a lot of these kinds of uh, representations are not completely unique and unprecedented. Right? One of my personal goals in life is to get people to think of children as something more than cute. Uh, and children are very cute, I completely agree with that. But there are a lot of other things as well. In, in this uh, last set of images, um, which are from a broader survey across the continent. Um, and this is something that you also find in a lot of depictions of African Americans in the United States um, from the same period and, and even much later. You see African children being represented as objects. So this image of the living scarecrows in a rice field in Zanzibar uh, positions once again these, these seemingly deeply unhappy children um, on this platform where they're serving the role of a scarecrow. And in this image, which I really hope is a manipulation, um, however, I have seen some uh, versions of this where white paint was used on black bodies um, as a sort of billboard or chalkboard. This, this uh, ludic um, postcard, to celebrate the, the new year is uh, literally um, objectifying the images of these children. And this again, brings together uh, several different tropes in terms of the anonymization of, of African children, the sort of um, specimen approach to lining them up for display and visual consumption, and the very problematic use of them as objects. Um, so as I mentioned, this is, I'm in the early stages of this project, I'm really uh, just starting to look across the different images that I'm encountering, I'm trying to collect them, uh, and also make a sort of typology of what I'm seeing. Um, I'm also trying to situate those readings within historical and cultural um, understandings of what was happening at the time. Uh, but one of the things that I'm also very aware of is there's this additional layer of meaning and this later social life of these postcards that takes place. Um, and this is a very sort of palimpsest uh, 
set of, of texts, right, that are layered on each other, sort of peeking through in, in different historical moments. So currently on eBay, the online global marketplace, um, there's two and a half million postcards for sale. Okay, and one of the things that uh, I'd like to also deal with in, in this project is the multiple readings uh, and the ways in which these colonial tropes perdure and they, they resurface and they take more um, seemingly modern terms, but they're also very deeply embedded in these centuries of uh, visual regimes and colonial ideology. So there's a whole subset of, of images, and I, I chose to, uh, to use the back of the card on purpose. Um, you probably are familiar with these images of, of bare-breasted women um, from across non-Western contexts uh, that are displayed as objects of um, erotic interest. Okay, and I think that the, the heading is quite revealing here. So these are key words, right? So you, these headings are, are created so that people who are coming to this marketplace will do their search and they'll find this product. Okay, so this is a black, nude, busty woman. And this is a pretty late example. Um, but you find a sexualization of girls uh, and of women. And this is something that um, many scholars have looked at, particularly coming out of North Africa, where the, this imagined harem context was staged for the voyeuristic um, male white gaze and consumptions. Um, so that just about brings me to an end. One of the other aspects of consideration, um, which I'm still really just starting to think about, is the question of affect. Because one of the things that strikes me as I look at these images of these real people, right, even though they're presented in these highly contrived, constructed ways, as I look at some of their faces and I look into their eyes and I try to imagine myself into their context, I'm really moved by uh, what I'm seeing in terms of the facial expressions. Now I know that there are a lot of challenges and problems to reading um, affect through such multiple layers of decontextualization, but I think it's something really worth thinking about. Um, so. You know, this is an image, for instance, that really stuck with me. Uh, you know, the experience of what it was like for these children to be photographed, they're often very unhappy, often in tears. Of course, young children cry. Uh, but for me, this is a very haunting image. Right, and you, th you think about some of the, the circumstances of the production of this image, standing in the hot sun, being forced to pose. These people would probably not have had any choice about being photographed. Okay? And I think that you can read resistance, you can read um, anger, you can read hurt in some of these expressions. So, I will close now um, because I'm interested to hear some of your questions. And thank you so much for your attention and your interest.